Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, we'll start reading in verse number 13. Of course, this is right after um, Jesus was crucified and he's now uh, resurrected. This is the third day after his crucifixion, so he's just appeared to uh, Mary Magdalene and some of the other uh, ladies there, of course, that went to the tomb and found it empty. Um, so we're uh, going to pick up there verse number 13. It says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre, and when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it, even so as the woman, women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets... He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is, in, is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for your word. Lord, and I pray that you uh, be with this message. I pray that you fill me with your spirit. Lord, help me to say only what you would have me to say, and I pray that you be with the hearts of, the, of those who are listening. Lord, that their hearts be tender to receive your, your word, and that the Holy Spirit move in a mighty way today. Lord, though, if there are any in here that have never accepted you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today they, they do that, Lord. They see their need, and they accept you, Lord. Thank you again for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Um, I, I love this account. And, of course, we have Jesus um, joining the two disciples who are walking on their way to Emmaus um, from Jerusalem. From what, I could, what some of the commentaries said, it was probably a two- to three-hour walk um, from, Emmaus, or from Jerusalem to Emmaus, the village of Emmaus. Um, and as I said before, this was the third day after the crucifixion. It was a Sunday, um, the first day of the week. We see that in John chapter 20, verse 19, that the third day after the crucifixion um, was the first day of the week. The Bible doesn't say why um, these two men are traveling to Emmaus. Um, maybe they, they had, they had um, taken up a room there, lodged there for the Passover time. Um, there's some speculation that maybe they were uh, starting to lose faith in Jesus Christ, obviously, since he had, he had been crucified. Um, and so they're maybe secretly um, leaving the disciples there in Jerusalem, going back. I don't really, I mean, you could probably make that application, but I don't really see any concrete evidence for that in Scripture. We don't really know why they were walking, but clearly God wanted them, to meet them on this road. 
Um, and Jesus, of course, uh, met them. And uh, Cleopas and his companion, they've got the walk of a lifetime. Um, to be able to walk along with, with Jesus Christ. And I think that any time after that, they were walking along that road, they would remember the time that Jesus appeared to them and talked with them on that, on that journey to Emmaus. And it would be a, such a, a sweet memory to have um, of, of that particular place, that road um, to Emmaus. But I believe that from their physical walk that we see here with Jesus Christ, um, we can draw some c characteristics of a spiritual walk that we could have with, with Christ. Um, they, actually, they were walking physically. They had Jesus Christ um, standing right there. But I believe that we can draw some applications for that for our spiritual walk with Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to be looking at, characteristics of a walk with God or of a walk with Jesus. Characteristics of a walk with God. Let's look there in verse number 14. As they start their journey, they, it says, And they talked together of all these things which had happened, of the crucifixion, of, of the dismay that they would have been filled with, and then, of course, when the women returned from the, from the tomb and said, it's empty. And we've seen angels saying that he is not here. If you look there in verse number 5, this is, again, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, as they were afraid and bowed down their faces, they, the angels, said unto them, why seek ye the living among the dead? So why, why are you seeking for Jesus Christ here where dead people lay? He's living. Why seek ye the living among the dead? And so these women return to the disciples, to the apostles, and they say there's no one there, and we've, we've seen an angel saying that he's living. He's not, he's not dead anymore. And, of course, we know Peter and John then went to that. They ran to the tomb, um, very anxious to find out what was going on. And, of course, all they found was the grave clothes wrapped up, and, of course, the napkin uh, wrapped up and laying, laying by itself. And uh, it could have caused great stir among the disciples now. Uh, of course, the Pharisees would say that the disciples stole the body, uh, but the disciples like, we, we don't know what happened. Um, at this point, third day, only Mary Magdalene, and uh, as we see here later on that day, it appears like he appeared to Simon Peter. Um, but Mary Magdalene, it looks like up to this point, is the only one who have actually, has actually seen and recognized Jesus Christ. And she's, of course, at that time, women would have been pretty low on the um, reliability list of witnesses. Uh, they wouldn't too much have believed a, uh, a woman, especially just one, if they would have had more than one see him, it would have been a little bit more believable. But they're talking of these things. And as they're walking, uh, they're talking of these things and walking along this road, Jesus joins them. And of course, we know that their eyes were, were hidden. And uh, verse number 18, and one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Are thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast not known the things which are come to pass there? In these days, and of course, Jesus is like, what, what, what things are you talking about? And they go on to, to talk about Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus Christ consumed these two people, these two men, consumed their lives. Um, all that they were focused on was Jesus Christ, I believe, before the, before the crucifixion. And also we see afterwards um, the wonderment of Jesus Christ. Now, did he, did he rise again? Did, did he really um, resurrect from the dead? It was consuming their life. That's the first characteristics we, we see of having a walk with God is Jesus Christ will consume your life. He will be what you are all about. That's what your entire focus, or your life is focused on, is Jesus Christ. If you have a true walk with God, that is what you will be consumed with, is Jesus Christ and his honor and his glory. We see as they were walking to Emmaus, they were talking of things concerning Christ. And when Jesus Christ um, joined them and asked what the, why they were sad and what they were talking about, um, they gave witness to Jesus Christ. They witnessed about him. And if you actually look at it, you see that they talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, now, they hadn't quite believed it themselves yet, but they were actually giving a presentation of the gospel, if you will, um, as they explained these things to Jesus Christ. I thought that was, that was interesting how he was crucified, and then he was, they went to the sepulcher, meaning he was buried, and then they're talking about how he was resurrected, how he was no longer dead, but he was living. They're actually giving a gospel. They were witnessing to this stranger of Jesus Christ. They were telling him about this man that they believed in, that they believed that he was God, that he was going to be the ones that would redeem Israel. Of course, he, we know that he not only redeemed Israel, but all the world um, with, his, with his sacrifice there on Calvary. But they were not talking about politics of the day, which Jews would have been prone to talk about in that time of the oppression of the Roman government. They were not talking of material things as they walked along, saying, hey, you, you know, how bad did it hurt you to have it make the sacrifice, or how much did you have to pay to, to buy the lamb for the sacrifice for the Passover? Um, they weren't talking about any of those things. They were talking about Jesus Christ. Their life was consumed with Jesus Christ. 
And if you have a walk with God, He will be your focus. He will be what you are consumed with. Not any sports or money or maybe even uh, health, trying to live a healthy life or having a good career or, or maybe living all about yourself, maybe how you, um, for living for pleasure. Um, that's not what you're going to be consumed with if you have a true walk with God. And if you are consumed with these things, um, you can mark it down that you do not have a close walk with God. You do not have a true walk with God if you're consumed with anything other than Jesus Christ. If anything else takes up most of your time, takes up most of your effort, takes up most of your money, um, you are not walking with God. The characteristic of a walk with God is Jesus Christ will consume your life. Let's turn over to 1 John 2. 1 John chapter 2. All these things that I mentioned, sports, money, health, career, pleasure, um, they will all pass away. And if you are consuming your life, if your life is consumed with those things, it's going to pass away. Your life's going to be useless when you come to the end of your life, if you have lived your life for these things. 1 John 2, verse 17, it says, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Again, if you are, not, if you are consumed with anything besides Jesus Christ, um, you're wasting your life. You're not truly walking with God. Look there at verse number 6 of 1 John 2. It says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Christ has given us the example of how to, how to live a life pleasing to God, how to walk with God. Um, and if we say that we are Christians, we are child, a child of God, uh, we should walk as Jesus Christ walked. We should be consumed. What was Jesus Christ consumed with on this earth? Fulfilling his Father's will. He said, all, throughout the, all throughout his ministry, he's saying, as when, they would try to, when the Jews would try to arrest him, and it wasn't the time yet, he would say, it's, it's not time for me. Um, and all, all throughout Scripture, he was trying to glorify the Father. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, he said it was for the glory of the Father. And that they would know, and that everybody would know that Jesus Christ was of the Father. But what is consuming your life? Is it yourself, or is it Jesus Christ? One of the characteristics of a walk with God is Jesus Christ will be what is consuming your life. With these two disciples, that was all they could talk about, was Jesus Christ. What do we talk about in our daily walk? As we go throughout and we talk with family, we talk with friends, what is the main topic of our conversation? It's really... A very convicting thought right now. The NBA playoffs are going on. I do follow sports a fair amount. Um, and, you know, I've talked with several men um, here in this church about the NBA playoffs going on. Um, but if I talk about that more than I talk about Jesus Christ and what we can do for him and maybe the ministry, uh, my life's focused on the wrong thing. Uh, and and that's, it, it's something that we have to check periodically. What is the focus of our life? But to have a true walk with God, you have to be consumed with Jesus Christ. Second thing we'll look at, verse number 25. It says, Then he said unto them, of course Jesus speaking to the two disciples, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Drop down to verse 32. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Here's another proof of having a walk with God is the expounding of the scriptures in your life. As you, as you read the Bible or as you come to the church maybe, are the scriptures, is the Bible being expounded to you? Are, are you understanding what you're reading? Is, is God illuminating things in your life as you go through the Bible? Um, that's one of the characteristics of a walk with God. If you, day after day, month after month, open your Bible in the morning and God does not illuminate anything to you or show anything to you, you're not having a close walk with God. Now, there will, there will not be great illumination every time you open the Bible. Um, that's, uh, sometimes we just got to keep going, doing what we know to do is right, even when it seems like we're not really getting anything. But I'm talking on a consistent basis. 
if you, God is not illuminating to you truths from the Bible, um, you're probably not walking with God. One of the characteristics here, we see Jesus expounding the scriptures to these two disciples. Uh, when I get to heaven, I hope I can watch a replay of this, this sermon, if you will. To have Jesus Christ himself go through the Old Testament and touch every single time that there was a prophecy about himself uh, would be absolutely incredible. We can draw, we draw some comparisons we know, uh, partially because the New Testament talks about this was a picture of Christ. Um, and we, we know some of, the, some of the scriptures concerning Jesus Christ. We know that from the Old Testament. But to have Jesus Christ hit every single verse, every single passage in the Old Testament and say, this was talking about me. Um, that would be, I, I would just love to be able to hear him expound on that. He expounded all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Jesus opened up their eyes. We see there in verse number 32. And while he opened to us the scriptures, he was explaining the scriptures to them. Um, and Christ will do that when you come to him sincerely seeking to get truths from his word. He will open to you the scriptures. He will expound to you the scriptures. And we know that the only way we'll be able to get anything from the Bible is if Jesus Christ opens our eyes to it. 1 Corinthians 2, I'm just going to read a few verses here. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. We've received the Holy Spirit, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. If you are trying to discern the Bible in your natural man, in the flesh, you will not be able to do it. It's a spiritual book, and we are natural. We must have the Spirit of God illuminating to us the truth of God's Word. And if you, are, if you do not have the Holy Ghost doing that in your life, you're not going to be able to understand it, and you will not have a walk with God. One of the characteristics. And that's, let's, let's look at a couple different aspects of that. In your devotions is what we're mainly hitting. Now let's turn over to Acts chapter 17. Studying the Bible for yourself. Christians should be getting most of their, the truths from the Bible in their devotions. If you're a strong Christian, you have a strong walk with God, most of your growing will be from your own personal devotions and getting into the Word of God. Not from the preaching. That's to help you. But you should be doing most of it on your own. It's Acts 17, verse number 10. This is Paul and, on one of his missionary journeys. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. In that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed. Also of honorable women which were Greeks and of men not a few. We see here that the Bereans searched the scriptures to see whether the preaching was accurate. The preaching of Paul and Silas, they went into the synagogue and started preaching Jesus Christ. And the Bereans here, especially the Jews, but we see also some of the Greeks, the Bible says that they searched the scriptures to see whether those things were so. It is very important for you to be able to search the scriptures. Um, and that's why one of the things we encourage everybody to have their own Bible, when the preacher says, turn to this verse, and he preaches out of a certain passage, it's good for you to be able to follow along and to see, is this actually truth that he is preaching? The brands searched the scriptures to see whether what Paul and Silas were preaching was the truth. Do you do that in your life? Do you search the scriptures and say, man, you know, Pastor McGovern's been hitting on this. And again, I have no, no doubt that Pastor McGovern is preaching truth. But do you search the scriptures on your own to maybe help you understand something a little bit better? Or maybe he hit on a certain topic, but he didn't delve into it very much. And you're like, oh, man, I want to study that out more. You search the scriptures on your own. Again, that is where Christians should be getting most of their growth. Most of their strength for their spiritual walk should be derived from your own personal walk with God, not from a preacher expounding the word. Again, that is there to help you. And God, it's very important in your life. But God does not want you to rely on three sermons a day 
uh, th three sermons a week to get close to God. He wants you to rely on your own walk with God. God longs to open the scriptures up to you. We see here Jesus Christ open the scriptures to the two disciples. Um, but he has to have your attention first if you're going to do that. What's consuming your life. Um, if your life is consumed with other, with other things and, and you just have a little box, five, a 10-minute box uh, time frame in your, in your morning that you say, okay, God, this is, this is your box. Give me something within this time frame or else, and then I, then I got to go. Um, what's consuming your life? When you can make your life consumed with Jesus Christ, he will open to you the scriptures. He has to have your attention first, though. If you're worried about what you're going to do after your devotions, um, I, I seriously doubt whether he's going to show you anything. Uh, if you're too worried about other things besides getting the truth from God's word. So you must be getting the truth. The Bible should be open to you in your devotions and also um, through the preaching of God's word. Nehemiah. Let's turn over to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah 8, verse number 8. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. This is Ezra and several other of the, the Levites, I believe. But they caused the people to understand the reading. And this is the place of the pastor, of the preacher, getting up, taking a, taking a portion of the Word of God, and helping you to understand what God is saying through that. Um, the book of Hosea, Hosea that pastor went through his series um, opened up my eyes completely uh, to the book of Hosea. I will never again um, look at Hosea the same. It was, to me, it was always, okay, God's just condemning the children of Israel like he is in all the other minor prophets and major prophets, um, saying repent. Uh, but pastor going through and helping, he caused us to understand the reading of the Word of God. Um, is God expounding to you when the pastor gets up and does that? Is he saying, hey, this is an area in your life that you could use? Um, are you having that Word of God expounded to you? Look at, drop down to verse number 12 of Nehemiah 8. It says, And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. To make great mirth, to have great joy. And of course we see that the joy of the Lord is their strength. We see in verse number 10. Um, but they were to have this great joy because the word of God had been expounded to them. And we should rejoice in God opening up his word to us. It should be a cause of joy for us. Saying, Lord, thank you so much for that truth. Thank you so much for giving us your word and helping us to understand it. Um, it, should be a, it should be a matter of joy for you. But in, in Luke chapter 24, let's turn back over there. Luke 24, Jesus Christ took on the role of the preacher in this instance. And he started again. He took the Old Testament and just went through the entire Old Testament expounding the things concerning himself. He took the role of the preacher and expounding the word of God to the men who, who had not been able to understand it up until this point. Um, we see that with the apostles as well, all throughout Christ's ministry, they think Jesus Christ is going to set up his kingdom now. Are you going to set up your kingdom now and, and wipe out the Romans? Uh, and Jesus is like, you know, you're not, you're not understanding the scriptures completely. Uh, and they didn't. because They were, they were blinded um, to the church age. It's, it's not really, you're seeing in the Old Testament too much. So God had, Jesus Christ had to constantly expound the scriptures to the apostles and especially to these two men here on the, on the road to Emmaus. Um, but if we're not walking with God, we're not going to be able to receive the preaching and apply it to our lives. When we hear, maybe we're going to hear a truth and it's going to hurt and we're like, man, I don't, I, that, that doesn't make me feel good. I'm, I, don't, I don't like that at all. I'm not going to apply that to our life. Uh, well, you don't have a walk with God then. Um, if you're not able to take the truths that God is expounding and apply it to your life, um, you're not walking with God. Characteristics of a walk with God. Um, Jesus Christ will consume your life and your, the scriptures will be open to you. They'll be expounded to you. The Bible will be opened to you. And then thirdly, let's look at verse number 28. It says, And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. 
But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. Third characteristic of a walk with God is you want Christ to abide with you. You want him to come in and live with you in your life. They're walking along. God, Christ is, is expounding the scriptures to them. He's opening you know, their eyes up. And then they get to their destination. And Jesus Christ acted like he would just keep on going. And Christ is waiting for an invitation in your life to abide with him. He will not force himself on you. But if you are walking with God and when you get to your house, and to your home, You'll, be, you'll say, I want Jesus Christ to abide with me. Abide with us, is what these two men said. At when Christ made as if he would have gone further, he's like, all right, I'll see you guys later. And he said, no, no, no stay with us. Stay with us. We know that the, it says that their hearts were burning within them while he was ex opening the scripture. Like, we don't want this person to leave. We don't want this man to leave. Do you have that characteristic of a walk with God, that you want Jesus Christ into your home? Many of us would be ashamed to invite Christ into our home because of what is in our home. Um, we don't want Christ living in our home because it might, he might change some aspects of our home that we don't want changed. We like it the way it is. And we're willing to go to church and, and, and listen to the preaching, and, and that's great, show up maybe, maybe in three times a week. But we don't want Christ with us every day, living with us. But that's one of the characteristics we see of a walk with God is at the end of the walk, these two disciples said, man, abide with us. Please come in, come in and stay with us. And then the Bible says that he went in to tarry with them. Um, when you open that invitation to Christ, he's not going to refuse it. He will come in, but he has to be invited. You have to invite Christ into your life. A carnal man will never want Christ to abide with him. Never. He will never say, man, I want, Je I want to spend more time around Jesus Christ. No, a carnal man will never want that. Um, but let's look a little bit about the blessings that come with abiding with Christ. Let's turn over to Psalm chapter 91. I could probably read the entire chapter with uh, the blessings that come when you're abiding with Christ, but we'll just hit a few verses here. Psalm 91, verse number 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in the darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. When you are abiding with Jesus Christ, when you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, um, you have protection from God that only He can give. Only Jesus Christ can protect you from these things. And look at verse number 5. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. Um, God gives a peace that, uh, that the world cannot understand. We see in, in the New Testament, it says a peace that passeth all understanding. The terror by night. Uh, you can't see in the night. You can't see what is lurking out there. But the Bible says there is a terror for the terror by night. There's a terror out there, but when you are abiding in Christ, um, you won't be afraid. You'll have that peace that Jesus Christ gives. You'll have that protection from the arrow that flieth by day and the pestilence um, that walketh in darkness. You can't see pestilence. You can see the effects of it, but you can't see pestilence. But so often in our life, we have things creeping into our life that we can't really pinpoint, but we can see the effects of it. We, but God said, when you abide with me, you're not going to be afraid for that. Um, that's not going to bother you when you're abiding in Christ when you're dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. That word abide there means, means to stay, to continue, continue to dwell in, in a certain place. Do we want Christ to dwell with us constantly and continually every day? And as days turn into weeks, weeks into months, months into years, do we want Christ to continue with us, to dwell with us? 
And look at the blessings that follow. He's going to cover us with his feathers. And, uh, and we're going to be under his wings. Of course, the great um, hymn about that, under his wings, I am safely abiding. And we know that Jesus Christ, while he was here on this earth, he went up on a hill overlooking Jerusalem. And he's like, man, Jerusalem, that, how oft would I have gathered you under my wings as, as, a, as, a, as a hen does her chicks? But ye would not. God wants to, to protect us, to put us under the shelter of his wings, but it's up to us. Jerusalem did not want to be under God's protection, so God did not protect them. If these two disciples would not have asked Christ to abide with them, he would have continued on. He's waiting for an invitation. But the Bible says that they constrained him. That constrained has, is, the, is a word meaning basically they forced him. Forced him contrary to his, his previous um, nature or, or his previous decision to go on. Like, man, come on, can they constrain him? The Bible says in verse 29 there of Luke 24. But they constrained him, saying, abide with us. Do you really want Christ to abide with you so much that you'll plead with him, and it looks like you'll have to change his mind until, uh, for him to abide with you? Of course, we know that's not true. God wants to abide with you. But sometimes he's going to just continue, act like he's going to go on, and ha he has to know how much you actually want him to abide with you. They constrained him. Let's turn over also to John 15, some of the blessings of abiding with Christ. John 15, we see that we have his protection when we abide with Christ. From all the things, that, all the dangers in the world, the terror by night, those things that we cannot see, um, God will give us peace in that time. But John 15, verse 5, says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And the men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. We see here again that Christ's main focus was that his Father be glorified there in verse number 8. But the blessings of abiding with Christ, we're going to be able to bear much fruit. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Without Christ, we can do nothing. We can't please God without Christ, without abiding in Christ. Just like a branch, if it is not connected to the tree or to the vine, as it gives the illustration here, there's no way it can bear fruit if it's not drawing any strength from the tree, from the vine. If it's disconnected from that, it has no way of getting the nourishment that it needs to, to bear fruit. None whatsoever. It just withers up and dies. We have plenty of, of dead branches out here um, from the winter laying all over the ground. They're disconnected from the tree. They can no longer bear leaves or bear fruit. Same is true in our Christian life. If we are not connected to Jesus Christ, if we are not abiding in him, we are not getting the nourishment that we need to be able to bear fruit. Bear fruit pleasing to God. And we see also that verse number 7, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. We have a promise from God that he will give us what we ask for. And again, this is all reliant on if we're abiding in Christ. Because if we are abiding, truly abiding in Christ, we will not ask for something that is contrary to God's will. If we're truly abiding in Christ, we're going to ask for stuff that is in uh, the realms of God's will. And when it is in the realms of God's will, he's going to give it to us. That's a promise. If you abide in Jesus Christ, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. The blessings of abiding in Jesus Christ. But then, of course, we see the cursing, if you will. If you don't abide in Christ, you're cast forth as a branch and withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. They're consumed. It comes to nothing. Just like when you're, when you're consumed with the things of this world, your life will come to nothing at the end of it. You'll have nothing to show for it because you did not abide in Christ. You're just a dead branch just waiting, waiting for fire to come along and consume it. And think about that, how, how much easier it is for a dead 
piece of wood to go up in flames than if you got something that you just pulled off the tree, some green wood. Um, it's a lot harder for that wood, the green wood, to catch fire than it is something that has been disconnected from the tree for, for months. It's a lot easier for that dead wood to go up in flames than it is that green wood. Are you abiding with Christ? Do you want Christ to abide with you? And we see here, let's turn it back to Luke 24. I think an important point here. That it was only after they asked him to abide with them that he revealed himself, himself to them. It was only after that. He did, not say, he did not open their eyes so that they could see who he was as they were walking by the way. And as he opened to them the scriptures, we think that would have, should have been a pretty good indication that someone this knowledgeable in the scriptures and everything concerning the Messiah um, should have been a pretty good indication that maybe this was the Messiah. But they probably thought, oh man, this is just a great teacher of the law that we haven't heard about. Um, but they continue on their way. But it was only after they asked him and they constrained him to abide with them that he opened their eyes to who he was. Of course, we know that when he broke the bread um, as they're about to eat, that their eyes were opened. But it was only after they asked him to abide with them. And God will reveal more of himself to you after you ask him to abide with you. We know the Bible and all the truths that we can glean from it there as they walked along the way. He expounded the, the scriptures to them. And that was, that was great, but you'll know more of God after he abides with you. God will reveal more to you when you reach that stage of wanting Christ to abide with you. So the question is tonight, or today, are you walking with Christ? Do you have some characteristics of a walk with Jesus Christ? Or are these characteristics lacking in your life? Are you consumed with the things of this world? Or as we touched with in Sunday school, are you like Demas? You love the world, so you'll depart from God. You'll forsake God. Because the world is what you are consumed with. Do you get the truth from God's word that you need for your daily walk? To be able to go through this world as a Christian and how dark and wicked the world is today, we need the strength from Jesus Christ. We cannot live it in our own power. We need that strength. Are you getting the Bible? Is the Bible being opened to you through your devotions or through the preaching? Are you getting that strength that you need for your life? And then do you, do you want Christ to live with you? Do you really, really want Christ to live with you? He will change your life. Absolutely will. You cannot invite the King of Kings and Lord of Lords into your life and expect things to remain the same. He will change your life, but what a change it will be. Instead of living for yourself, you start living for God. And you start laying up for yourself treasures in heaven where you don't have to worry about the things that will pass away as we saw there in 1 John. The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And when you abide with Christ and he abides with you, you're never going to be separated when you come up to death, you're not going to be separated from Christ. You're going to be present with the Lord. If you live for all these things of the world, it comes to death, you're going to be separated from them. But if you live for Christ, you'll never have that separation. What you have lived your life for, you'll have with you in eternity. What is consuming your life? Are you getting into the Word of God? And do you really want Christ to abide with you? Would you constrain Him? Or would you just give him a casual invitation? Hey, you know, if you've got nowhere else to stay, you might as well stay with me. No, they constrained him. They said, come on, come on. We, got, we, got a, we already got a, a room set up. We got the meal ready. Abide with us. We want to hear more. We want to know more of what you have to say. Characteristics of a walk with God. Are you walking with God? If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, um, that's the first step. The two men we discussed here were already disciples of Jesus Christ. They already were saved. But maybe you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That means you have, not only is he not abiding with you and you cannot walk with him, he is your enemy. You already have the condemnation of God, the wrath of God abiding on you. The Bible says that in John chapter 3, that he that hath the Son hath life. 
But he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, and the wrath of God abideth on him. Not only is he not your friend and one you can walk with and stay, have stay in your home, um, he's your enemy. And his wrath is storing up until the day of judgment. And when that judgment comes, it's too late. You have to make peace with God now. Not pacify him, but you have to have that peace from God. And that comes through accepting his work on, of, on Calvary, of how he took your sins upon, your, uh, upon himself, suffered the punishment of sin in your place so that you could have access into heaven through the gift of eternal life, but you have to accept it. He's already paid your sin debt. He's already given you the ticket, if you will, to heaven. But if someone's giving you a ticket to Hawaii, or he's offering it to you, and you never take that ticket, but you go down to the, to the uh, airport, and you say, hey, I'm supposed to be going to Hawaii on that flight. They'll ask you, where's your boarding pass? You can't get to the flight without having that ticket, that boarding pass. Same thing as in heaven. The flight has already, your ticket has already been paid for. It's already been punched through. But if you do not have, if you do never accept that ticket, you're not going to get to where you want to go. Christ has already paid for your ticket, so to speak, to heaven. All that remains is for you to accept it, to realize you were a sinner and that he paid your sin debt. And all that takes is to believe on Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And then of course the Philippian jailer, when he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He's already paid the debt. All that it takes is you accepting that free gift of salvation. Won't you do it this morning? Won't you do it tonight? Or this, today? Before it's too late. We're going to give a time of invitation, and we're going to have some... Um, People here on, on either side that can take you aside and explain more. If you want to learn more, I beg of you that you take one of us aside and say, hey, what's this all about? Again, we'll have some people set up to the side. And with that, let's go ahead and go into the invitation. Every head bowed, every eyes closed.